fundamentally, the question is this. You've got a message that you want to send, and it's either yes or no. Or sometimes in signalling they call it acknowledge and not acknowledge, ack and knack, or yes and no. It's all very well, but they might get damaged, they might get corrupted. Coding theorists, in the very simplest case, did realise that in order to be able to correct an error, just a one-bit error, you needed to repeat it three times. On computer file, here we have talked about this stuff in more detail. But I want to try and keep this as accessible as possible to people who are just coming at this for the first time. And to try and explain what it is about these three-bit codes that makes life so much easier. And the answer, my friends, lies in putting them at diametrically opposite corners of a cube. What you're saying is, if you send three zeros, that's fine. If you send three ones, they don't get corrupted, that's fine. Just look how far away they are from each other. It doesn't matter how you get from there to there or backwards, you have to go one, two, three. So that's technically called the distance between these two code words. So there's two buzz phrases straight away, code words and distance between them. If you, on either side of these accurate code words, you write in what you might get if one of the bits gets corrupted and flipped. You now have a situation where if you receive 0, 1, 0, the answer is sometimes called majority logic. The overwhelming decision of this point is that it's got two zeros and one one. So therefore, if you're going to correct it, it's far better to correct it to three zeros, going down one edge, than to try and go all the way around the cube and correct it to that. We're using a total of three bits, like one, 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 three bits. But the actual message we're trying to get across is yes or no, ack or knack, zero or one. So of those three bits, the only bit that counts as far as the message is concerned is just one of those bits. However, in the course of keeping these code words far apart, we have agreed they are distance three from one another in terms of a walk you do around the cube along the edges. So here we are, total number of bits, Number of those bits that are devoted to the real message, only one. How many journeys around sides of the cube would you have to take to get from one code word into another? So it's a 313 code. 313 is the simplest full Hamming code. And it is perfect. What do I mean by saying it is perfect? Every single corner, all eight of them, serves a purpose. A corner is either a code word, the actual thing you're trying to get through and hope it doesn't get damaged, or if it's not a code word, it's a correction vector. It's a corner of the cube that's adjacent, which gives you the clue that if you get that received, you go to the nearest code word along a cube edge. So every single corner is concerned with either the proper message or how to correct it. Nothing goes to waste. Three, one, three. Hmm. Where do you think the next one of these perfect ones would occur that occupy all the corners? Not on a cube this time, it'll have to be on a hypercube. So hypercube's gonna have what, another four another. Well it could be corners, four, or... it could be a four-dimensional hypercube, a five-dimensional oh, six, gosh. Okay. whatever. I think I feel like it's going to be a round number. Let's go for six. Six, one, something. Close. It's not. I will reveal the answer and then we'll try and justify it later on. That's the simplest proper Hamming code. Next full Hamming code is not at six, it's at seven. And in this notation... Is this prime number related then? No. Uh, it's not actually prime number related, but you will see a pattern emerging. This right-hand thing of three is always there. Even if you're on a hypercube, you keep your code words three edges apart. And what happens with more bits in use is you can afford more bits to hold the message. Whereas before, we only had a one-bit message, two possibilities. Here, we've got a four-bit message, which equates to 
16 possibilities, 16 possible code words, two to the power of four, all wrapped up in a seven bit message. Now, your final clue, the next one after this, 15, 11, three. There is a pattern emerging here, folks, particularly on that leading digit. Three, seven, 15. Always one less than a power of two. That's a necessary condition, together with distance three between code words, for these to be proper full Hamming codes. And what I'm saying to you is 743 is also perfect. Let's try and reason why it's perfect by waving our hands around a lot, okay? It goes like this. You've got four code words. They're on a seven-dimensional hypercube. If it's a seven-dimensional hypercube, out of every code word corner, there are, try and imagine it, seven edges going out to correction points for it. Plus the corner itself, so seven plus one is eight, right? You've got eight possible things, either the thing itself or its correction points. Every code word counts eight in terms of corners of the hypercube. But how many of these code words can you have? Two to the power of four is 16, and everyone takes up eight corners, 16 times eight. Uh, eight to... Four, is 128. 128, yeah. Well, I do we agree. Eventually. So <laughs> you need 128 corners. Just by reasoning from a cube right up to a seven-dimensional hypercube, you can say you would occupy 128 corners. But consider seven-bit codes, which is what we're talking about in this hyperspace. What's two to the power of seven? 128. Bingo! So you've got 128 corners and they are exactly used up. That is what a perfect code is all about. It's about using up the corners on your hypercube to the absolute maximum. It's so eco-friendly, you know. Absolutely nothing goes to waste. The big problem with these Hamming codes is that they only correct one error. That is the stopper in the end, that they're just not suitable for the kinds of situations that occur in real life, or at least out in noisy Wi-Fi setups or out in interplanetary space. Very comparable, really, in terms of background noise, bursts of horrible, you know, activity going on there that ruin your code. You need something rather more robust than a code that can detect only one error. But nevertheless, as a thing to learn about first, and the ability to entirely cover certain hypercubes with the codes and the way to correct them, they're very nice. I'm very fond of perfect codes. <laughs> Does this mean that other codes in between these are unusable? No. For those in the know, we've done one already. We used Richard Hamming's methodology to develop it, but we didn't admit to its shortcomings, right?